Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Ada Achinaya. I'm a student at the Academic Unit of Reproductive and Developmental Medicine. My research work is on the cost and ability to afford infertility treatments, such as IVF, and how this impacts the stress patterns in these infertile couples in two different countries. One in the UK, where it's primarily funded by the NHS, and in Nigeria, my home country, where it's actually funded directly out of the pockets of these patients. Now, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my research. However, most importantly, I'm going to tell you about what actually motivated me to go through this line. I wasn't always involved in reproductive medicine. Actually, I was a hematologist, which is um, a lab scientist that deals with blood and blood-related diseases for quite a while. And that's actually what I read as an undergrad. Now, to become a hematologist in Ghana, where I trained, you actually have to work as an intern for about two months in a rural lab, and then eventually write a thesis. So on my first day, getting to the lab, I walked in, greeted everyone, and then took a seat on one of the you know, wooden rickety stools there. And then but across the room on the wall was a picture of a woman crying with what seemed like rain or something just around her. But then there was an inscription beside it that actually said, I cry in the shower so no one can see my tears. I stared at that picture for what seemed like hours until I felt hot tears drop down my cheeks. I really wanted to help prevent those tears, but then I already work with blood, so I wasn't sure how I was going to do that. But then I eventually decided to incorporate those two and work on postpartum depression and anemia as an undergrad. Now, fast forward a couple of years afterwards, I decided to do a master's. Now, I knew I wanted to work with women, and I knew I wanted to prevent them from crying, but then I wasn't sure what profession or course would actually allow me to do that. Because remember, the, the woman that was crying in the picture was crying, but then there was no particular reason as to why she was crying. So that was still a bit of a mystery for me. Now, one very random day, I was at home, and there was a knock on the door, more like banging, actually. And I went and I opened the door, and it was my Aunt Rosie, my mom's younger sister. She was sweaty, hyperventilating, she was crying, her eyes were bloodshot red. You could tell she'd actually been crying for hours. Now, I ran upstairs and I called my mom. But then I decided to eavesdrop and just find out why she was actually crying. She talked about the emotional and sometimes physical torture she goes through in the hands of her husband and her in-laws because she'd been married for over 11 years without any child. She also said that her mother-in-law referred to her as a bull, which is, you know, a male cow, and would often say, oh, my son married a bull and kept her at home. And she often pressured her son to take another wife. Now, in my country, there is a lot of value placed on having children. And when this is not easily achieved, a lot of couples get ostracized from social and community events. The men are often pressured to remarry. And an infertile woman has no inheritance whatsoever in the event her husband dies. Now, in some other African countries, the situation is actually a lot worse. The women are sometimes denied just basic necessities, such as food, clothing, money, or even you know, fuel to power their house. My mom was able to console her sister, but then that actually hit me. And at, it was at that point I actually decided that I knew what angle my search to prevent those tears were going to take reproductive medicine, particularly infertility. Now, of course, my story didn't quite end there because I decided to do a PhD. And then because a PhD is super specific, I knew I was going to you know, go into reproductive medicine. And I knew that I wanted to work with infertile couples or women, but then 
what particularly about them did I actually want to research? So I that still remained a mystery for me. So I decided that I was going to uh, talk to one of the most renowned fertility specialists in the country, in my home country, Dr. Ibueli. And he, he owns one of the biggest fertility labs in the country. I walked into his office that day and I was amazed that the four walls of his office were covered with certificates and plaques and commendations and so many things. It was spanning almost two to three rows. And I was quite intimidated, but then I had gone there for his help. So as we got talking, there was a knock on the door and the person came in. It was a man in a regular t-shirt and jeans. And then the doctor said, have you brought the two million naira? And the man said, no doctor, but, and the doctor said, get out. That, the man walked out with his head in his hands and then the door closed behind him. Now, two million naira to an average Nigerian man is the equivalent of 100,000 pounds to an average Englishman. Most couples can't actually afford that. And most times they actually have to seek help or borrow money from the churches, from their families, from their friends, from social support groups, different aspects just to fund that treatment. And most cases, and in most cases, a pregnancy is still not achieved. I'm not quite sure I remember what advice the doctor gave me afterwards, but then that moment never left me. And I was at that point, I'm guessing unknowingly to him, that actually struck me and, this, and that was where the beginning of my research area started. I decided that I was actually going to focus on the impact of the ability to afford this treatment and the stress factors it causes on these couples. In a country like Nigeria, where the total fertility rates are actually about five to six child or children per woman, 20% of the population still remain infertile. But with a population size of about 180 million people, it's no wonder the government doesn't really focus much on infertile couples. They are still trying to get rid of the overpopulation. So there still remains a demographic paradox of barrenness and missed plenty. In conclusion, I'm going to talk about um, a poem that I saw online by an infertile blogger. Her name is Ellen Garfield. And she says, I would gladly trade places with the women I see. The joy in their faces, why can't that be me? They complain of stretch marks and sometimes of heartburn. Their feet may get swollen and stomachs in turn. I would gladly trade places with the women I see, but instead battle daily with infertility. My months filled with chartings, my days filled with meds, I live on white sheets on hospital beds. But if I trade places with the women I saw, I'd miss life's greatest lesson, patience as a gift to all. Thank you. <laughs>